So if you ever have to fight a xenomorph, would knowing things about the Spanish Armada help you out? Maybe. Hi, I'm Mike Siegel. I'm an astrophysicist. I write for Ordinary Times, and this is The Throughput. So we're back in our usual digs, back with our usual program. We're going to review a movie. We're going to jump right in. You're actually going to get a twin spin today. We're going to review two movies. I'm going to react to Alien and Aliens, the 1979 Ridley Scott film and the 1986 Jim Cameron film. Now, a few concepts I won't be talking about because we've covered them in other videos. Uh, hypersleep uh, plays a big role in these. I covered that in my video on 2001. There's also a lot of scenes where you see the spaceship sort of coasting in space with its engines off, just using momentum. I also covered that in my 2001 video. Another thing I won't be talking about in this video are the spaceships. I talked about the Nostromo and the Sulaco in my uh, ranking spaceships video, both their realism and their coolness. But we're going to jump right into things that I didn't cover uh, starting right here. Keep trying. Calling Antarctic traffic control. Do you read me, Antarctica? Over. This is I found it. Just showed us over to reticulate. Registration. You need to read me. So the crew is expecting to return to Earth. They've been woken up a little early, and she says they found it. They're short, just short of Zeta to reticuli. That is an actual star. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system in the constellation of Reticulum. Zeta indicates the uh, ranking of how bright it is compared to the other stars in that constellation. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star, a wide binary with two stars separated by hundreds of astronomical units. That star is about 40 light years away from Earth. Both of the stars in the Zeta Reticuli system are similar to the Sun. They're both very young. They're about one to three billion years compared to the four and a half billion year age for our solar system. And that actually corresponds quite well with what they say later on when they land on LV-426 and describe its environment as primordial. It is like the Earth might have been a few billion years ago when there wasn't life on the Earth. 40 light years, that gives us a scale to the alien universe that 40 light years means that that's sort of maybe halfway between where they were coming from and where they're going to Earth. I can't imagine any ore that is so valuable that it would be worth it to cart it over 100 trillion miles rather than just mine it in the solar system, but we'll go with that. Uh, you still do have this problem with the alien universe where you're traveling in real space, but how are you traveling faster than light? They're clearly traveling faster than light since we find out in the next movie, Ripley thought she would be home by Christmas. So, but we do get some scale. We do get a real star. So this is some nice science. Where do you want to do this? This isn't just below the knuckle there. Mm -hmm. It's done by... The xenomorph itself is one of the most iconic creatures in science fiction history, not the least because of H.R. Geiger's amazing design for this uh, creature and the way that they uh, mostly have it in the shadows so you never catch a clear glimpse, except, but, but which makes it even more terrifying. But let's go over some of the aspects of the xenomorph and see, are these realistic or is this just science fiction? First of all, endoparasitism. The uh, face hugger grabs onto the face uh, implants the egg within the host, and then it bursts out of the chest. Is that realistic? Is that crazy? Actually, it's pretty realistic. There are species of wasps that will paralyze larvae or spiders or caterpillars and implant their eggs in the living host. And then those hosts hatch out and eat the living host from within. And so this is actually quite realistic. These wasps actually played a big role in science. Uh, Charles Darwin, when he went on the voyage of the Beagle, discovered these creatures, these uh, wasps that paralyzed their hosts and let them be eaten from within. Darwin was uh, actually kind of religious uh, and his, his training was in religion. He has a famous quote where he says, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have design designedly created the ignominy with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. He could not believe that God would deliberately make the reproductive cycle of the wasp so unspeakably cruel to such a creature. However, if evolution was around, if this thing could evolve randomly, and the universe was rather uncaring about that sort of cruelty, that made sense. So in a way, it was a way for him to reconcile his religious beliefs with his scientific findings. 
Later on, Ash says that the creature has a skin of uh, complex polysaccharides that's giving way to silicon. This is very similar to chitin, which is the material that uh, forms the endoskeleton of crustaceans and that they eventually molt and shed, just like the creature in the movie does. So also kind of, under, kind of realistic. Now the acid blood is probably not gonna work. Blood needs to do certain things, such as bind to oxygen, carry it through the body, and release it to the cells. And given how fast the aliens move, they need to process oxygen pretty fast. You're basically combining free hydrogen radicals with oxygen and creating OH or H2O. And so that's not going to work as well as an iron-based blood or something like that. However, if this were a defense mechanism, if the aliens have a circulatory system that uh, transfers food and oxygen within the blood and this acid system that acts as a defense, that kind of makes sense. So maybe acid for blood is just what they assume and then it has this. Also not that unrealistic. We have a very powerful acid in our own bellies, in our digestive system. It's controlled through the mucus lining of the stomach most of the time, but that uh, is a very powerful acid. Hippos, when they're exposed to sunlight, are known to secrete what's called a blood acid. It isn't actually blood, but it's a material that coats their skin and protects them from the sun and gets rid of microbes, and it's somewhat acidic. So again, not that unrealistic compared to what we see in nature. The, the infamous double jaws where the alien parts its jaws and another jaw comes out and grabs people, very scary. Not that unrealistic, actually. There are many creatures that have these double jaws. The most famous is the moray eel, which has an outer pair of jaws that grab its prey, and then an inner pair of jaws, which then pull it down into its gullet. So not quite what we see in the aliens, but somewhat similar. And in fact, the most unrealistic thing about the aliens is that they manage to grow to such enormous sizes without any obvious source of food or nutrition. So that's, uh, the, I would say, the most unrealistic thing. Now, we do later find out, and it's hinted at in these movies, that the aliens, the xenomorphs, are bioengineered. And so they don't actually have to be a product of evolution. In terms of biological systems, what we see in nature, nothing about them crosses me as that unrealistic. Someone clearly put some thought into these creatures. Maybe they didn't know about you know, moray eels and hippo blood or anything like that. But it's not that unrealistic to think that a creature like this could be engineered. This is, of course, the scene where we find out that Ash is an android and he attacks and attempts to kill Ripley uh, before they're able to kill them. In my video on Forbidden Planet, I talked about Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. This is why you have them. Uh, in the next movie, uh, Bishop talks about how he has fundamental programming. That could never happen now with our behavioral inhibitors. It is impossible for me to harm or by a mission of action allow to be harmed a human being. That's right out of the laws of robotics, and that's why Bishop is a good android and Ash is a bad one. All right, so the self-destruct system. Seems like every spaceship in science fiction has a self-destruct system. Now, I'm not a Navy veteran. I've never heard from a Navy veteran that our ships have self-destruct buttons, even the ones with nuclear reactors on board. So is this just a science fiction cliche? Not really. Ships at sea have always had a self-destruct system. It was called the water. Since so we have sailed ships on the water. Ships have been deliberately scuttled to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy or because they're too damaged or to uh, prevent a means of escape or anything like that. You poke holes or you damage it, you send the ship to the bottom. One of the most famous naval engagements in history actually turned on the equivalent of self-destruct systems. And I'm talking, of course, about the destruction of the Spanish Armada in 1588. One of the tactics that the English used to 
uh, scatter and eventually disable parts of the fleet were fire ships. You would take an old decrepit ship, set it on fire and send it into the middle of the fleet or load it up with explosives so that when it got to the middle of the fleet or into a port or something like that, it would explode. Fire ships have been used for a couple thousand years uh, to destroy enemy ships and to scatter enemy formations. In the end, the Spanish Armada lost 44 ships, but 10 of those they lost themselves. They scuttled them because they were too badly damaged to get back to port, and they didn't want the English or the Dutch to capture them. So this business of destroying ships actually has a history in naval tradition. Now, we do actually have spaceships that have self-destruct systems. One of the most infamous was the uh, solid rocket boosters on board the shuttle. They were designed so that if they uh, were a danger to anyone on the ground, they could be exploded. After the Challenger disaster, the solid rocket boosters were still intact and were going off out of control. And the range officer decided that they represented a danger. And while everyone else was still freaking out about the explosion, had the presence of mind to activate the self-destruct that destroyed those two uh, solid rocket boosters so there wasn't more destruction on the ground. There are very good reasons why you might equip a spaceship with a uh, self-destruct system. You can't just sink it to the bottom of the ocean. It's, it's in space. It's going to just be floating around. So you might not want it to be captured by an enemy. You might have reason to believe that it's a danger, you know, like a rocket taking off. Now, the way they do it in the movie is a little bit of a stretch. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to a similar thing in Aliens. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea of a self-destruct system, it's a cliche, obviously, but I don't think it's that unrealistic a cliche, given the history of naval warfare and our own history with the space program. Now, there is a little bit of an unrealistic aspect of this in that you have three explosions go off after the self-destruct is detonated. I'm not sure why that would happen. One of those explosions is enough to destroy the whole ship, but whatever. Why don't you just check out LV 426? Because I don't have to. There have been people there for over 20 years, and they never complained about any hostile organism. What do you mean? What people? Terraformers. Planet engineers. They go in, set up these big atmosphere processes to make the air breathable. It takes decades. It's what we call a shake and bake colony. So terraforming. Uh, this is a subject that I don't think has come up on this channel. Um, can it be done? In principle, yes. Uh, there's a really great Kurtzegazak video I've linked in the description below that talks about how you could terraform Mars uh, using lasers and so forth. It is theoretically possible to reshape a planet, or in this case a moon, into being habitable. After all, the elements are there. You have oxygen, you have carbon, you have nitrogen, you have iron and so forth. It's just a matter of rearranging them. Now I say it's just a matter of rearranging them. You're talking about massive achievements of uh, solid state physics and particle physics and nuclear physics. But if you're talking about whatever technology, it could be done. I mean, after all, our own planet Earth was in a sense terraformed over the course of billions of years by microorganisms, by flora and fauna, by changes in the environment, and is still being terraformed today by human activity. Now, he says it takes decades. It would probably take more centuries, even with a body as small as LV-426. But yeah, you could reprocess the atmosphere and make it a little bit more breathable, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out with our own atmosphere, how to pull carbon dioxide out. So I don't think uh, terraforming is that unrealistic, especially when they're talking about this kind of time scale where it's going to take decades or centuries to do so. I don't know if you would be able to make the atmosphere breathable the way they show in this movie in just uh, a period of uh, 20 years but maybe around the plant where you have this new atmosphere flowing out that's a little bit more oxygen rich and a lot less carbon dioxide rich, you would be able to breathe the atmosphere for a period of time. So uh, this is not that unrealistic. First of all, this is I, this is wonderful movie making that they're establishing this mech suit in an early scene where you know it's just sort of a character moment that will then become, of course, important in the climax of the movie. 
But there is actually a good uh, scientific point. This has been 35 years. Why don't we have mech suits like that that people routinely use? I've actually asked this question around a few times, and there's a couple of answers I've gotten. One of which is that bipedal robots are really hard to build. We think of walking around on two legs as normal because we've been doing it since we were toddlers. But it's actually very complicated and very difficult to work out. Your brain actually does a lot of work to keep you balanced on two legs. It's not a natural motion. And getting robots to do this without falling over is really tricky. You will see occasionally robotics companies come out with sizzle reels where they'll show a, a two-legged robot jumping up on crates and picking up boxes and stuff like that. But that's really very difficult to accomplish. The main reason, however, is that for most of the applications that you would use this, we have specialized robots and mechanics to do this. For example, they show them loading one of the missiles onto the landing craft. You actually have specialized equipment that would do that, so you make sure you don't drop it and damage it. So it's a technology that's probably not that far out of reach, but we just don't have a lot of practical need for it. <laughs> So a little bit of inaccuracy in this drop, pit, drop ship scene. The Sulaco is in stable orbit around the planet, obviously. It's in this orbit going around and around and around. That orbit does not need any fuel to maintain it. I discussed this in my 2001 video. Once you are in orbit, once you've got that balance where you're going fast enough that by the time gravity makes you fall towards the surface of the planet, you've gone all the way around it, uh, you don't need any fuel. Isaac Newton is in the driver's seat and you could be in orbit theoretically forever. The drop ship is not gonna just fall out of the Sulaco like a, like a rock or a brick or something like that. You're actually gonna to need to give it some momentum to send it down because if you detach it, it has the same orbit as the Sulaco. It's got the exact same speed, the exact same altitude, and so it's not gonna just drop. You're just gonna, you're actually gonna to have to fire some engines to get it down. And then you see what happens is as it's falling, it hits the, the engines and it goes zooming off. That's actually not gonna work either. Uh, one of the most difficult things for people to get a handle on is orbital dynamics. It's really complicated. Uh, some of the commenters on my previous videos have mentioned the Kerbal Space Program, which has realistic physics when you're docking with spacecraft and stuff like that, and how hard it is to do that. Let's say you're in the Sulaco. If you give yourself a huge burst of speed, what's going to happen? You're not going to go down towards the planet. You're actually going to go around like this and go into a more elliptical orbit, a higher energy orbit. What you actually need to do is kill your momentum, fire a reverse engine so that you fall, instead of going around the planet, you fall towards the surface. This is what our, our astronauts do on re-entry. Cameron is going for a kind of Vietnam aesthetic with the dropship being kind of like a Huey and so forth. I get that, but it is a little bit inaccurate. Lieutenant, what did those pulse rifles fire? 10 millimeter explosive tip caseless, standard light armor piercing round one. Well. Look where your team is. They're right under the primary heat exchangers. So? So, if they fire their weapons in there, won't they rupture the cooling oh, system? Oh, oh, yeah, she's absolutely right. So? So what? Look, this whole station is basically a big fusion reactor. Right? So, she's talking about a thermonuclear explosion and adios muchachos. Oh, great. All right, now I'm gonna talk about the self-destruction of the, of the Nostromo and, and this scene here. What they're saying is that you have a big fusion reactor and if you break the cooling systems, it's gonna explode like a bomb. And the, the destruct system on the Nostromo is basically shutting down the cooling system to their fusion reactors and they went off like a bomb. That is scientifically inaccurate, at least by what we know so far of fusion reactors. When we talk about nuclear reactors, there are two types of reactors. One of those, the one that we use commercially, is a fission reactor. The way fission works is you get heavy elements like uranium and you let them break down. When they do that, some mass of the uranium atom is converted into energy. That famous Einstein equation tells you that you're going to get an enormous amount of energy for that small bit of mass that's destroyed. What you are trying to do with, say, a nuclear bomb or a nuclear reactor is get a chain reaction. In a nuclear bomb, for example, when the uranium atom breaks down, it releases neutrons. Those then hit other uranium atoms cause them to break down, which releases more neutrons, which hit other uranium atoms, causes them to break down, which releases more neutrons, and so on and so on and so on, and so on until you get a runaway reaction. 
that is only achievable at very high densities, what we call critical mass. And so the way the first nuclear bombs worked was by firing a, a plug into a sphere or something like that to hit that critical mass that you would get that chain reaction. Nuclear reactors aren't like nuclear bombs. First of all, the fuel in them is not nearly as pure. Second of all, they're not packed in such a way that you can reach that critical mass. Now, there are various ways that you control the that you keep control of a nuclear reactor. The primary way is pushing water in between the uranium rods. That both carries away heat, and in most reactors, the water acts as a moderator. Then when the neutrons fly off the uranium atoms, they're pr frequently going too fast to hit other uranium atoms. The water slows them down so they are more likely. So the water enhances the reaction. Now there have been three major accidents involving nuclear fission reactors. In Three Mile Island, you had a valve get stuck open and a lot of that water leaked out. So the reactor lost its coolant. And that heat couldn't be carried away. So the reactor core did in fact melt down. It got so hot that actually melted the insides and you have this corium mass of material inside the reactor. But it wasn't a disaster and it didn't go off like a bomb for several reasons. One of which is these reactors are designed with what we call a negative coefficient. As the water evaporates, remember it's moderating and enhancing the reaction. So as the water evaporates, the reaction rate drops. And so you have a negative feedback system where as the reactor begins to run away, the reaction rate drops and you're actually getting less and less reaction as things progress. And you also had a very good job done of containing it. You had a containment building. And it, so it's likely that very few people, maybe no one will die from radiation induced cancer because of Three Mile Island. Now with Fukushima, that was a much worse uh, condition. In this case, you had a tsunami that came in and it destroyed the diesel generators that kept the water circulating while the nuclear power plant was shut down. Now that caused two problems. One, it caused three of the reactors to melt down that they couldn't get that coolant. But again, they didn't explode like atomic bombs because as the water drains out, the reaction rate drops. So you have that negative feedback keeping it under control. The second thing that happened was when nuclear rods are spent, when you've used up most of the fuel, you put them in a pool of water. This is because they are one, very hot, and two, they're still giving off a lot of radiation. The water both absorbs the heat as long as you keep the water flowing and keeping the, moving the heat away, and you also protect people from radiation. When Fukushima lost power, that meant that that water wasn't flowing. So it began to overheat, it boiled away, and you had these hydrogen explosions uh, from the cooling pools from that water boiling away. But again, that incident was contained. They did a, evacuated the nearest 20 miles. And so it's not clear what the eventual health costs will be, but it's probably actually gonna be quite low uh, that, the rea that the incident was contained. Now, the third and the most severe was Chernobyl. Chernobyl, however, used a different design. The Soviet Union used this thing called the RBMK design. What it did was it used carbon sheaths around the uranium rods to act as the moderator to slow down the, the neutrons and enhance the reaction. And it used water both to carry away the heat and to slow down the reaction. In this case, there were a whole bunch of things that went wrong. And if you watch the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl, it does an excellent job of explaining the many, many factors that led to this disaster. But one of the things with the coolant was, as the coolant evaporated, as it turned to steam, that actually enhanced the reaction because it had a positive void coefficient. Only the Soviet Union uh, designed reactors that way. And so what you had was this runaway reaction. It had this uh, huge surge of energy. It had an explosion that was so powerful, it blew the many ton uh, top off of the reactor. They didn't have a containment building like we have in the West. So it just began spewing radioactive uh, debris everywhere. But even then it wasn't like a nuclear bomb. It was more like a dirty bomb. It was a very bad incident, but it wasn't like you'd set off an atomic bomb. Now what they're talking about in this movie is fusion. Fusion is where you take light elements like hydrogen and you ram them together to create heavy elements and you get mass converted into energy that way. The thing about fusion reactions is they're even more difficult to achieve than fission reactions. There are only four places in the solar system where fusion reactions happen. One is at the center of the sun where it is 15 million degrees and hundreds of times the density of water, and you have these extreme conditions because of the huge star crushing down on that center, and that can ram those hydrogen atoms together. Remember, hydrogen nu nuclei are positively charged, so they don't want to get close together. You have to have enough energy to overcome that repulsion and merge them together. The second place this occurs is in thermonuclear weapons. 
This is where you have a fission reaction that goes off, like a regular atomic bomb, and it creates this shock wave that compresses the hydrogen together and causes it to fuse, gets to that density where it fuses. Uh, this is how most of our nuclear weapons are powered these days. Now, there are two ways we have tried to establish commercial fusion. One is with uh, what we call a tokamak. What this creates is a very powerful magnetic field, and it uses that magnetic field to squeeze the hydrogen together until it fuses. This works, but for now at least, you're putting more energy into the reaction than you're getting out. The one you may have heard on recently, and I have a link in the description below, is the uh, laser implosion technique. This was the recent breakthrough where they have a little ball of hydrogen, and they surround it with diamond. They blast it with lasers. That creates an implosion that crushes the hydrogen together and causes it to fuse. And in this case, uh, they actually got more energy out of the reaction than they put in. The thing to notice about what I've been talking about with fusion, it's hard. You need very specific conditions in order for fusion to happen. And if those, fu those conditions fall apart, the fusion stops. There is a natural negative feedback system in a fusion reactor that it's so hard to achieve that fusion that if anything starts breaking down, the fusion stops. If the tokamak's magnetic field starts breaking apart, the fusion stops. If the lasers aren't firing rate, the fusion stops. You can't get a runaway like they have in this system. If you lose the reactor coolant, you're going to have a reactor that just shuts down and stops putting out energy. Now, I'm not going to completely rule it out. There, they're set 150 years in the future. Maybe they're using some technology that we don't understand. Maybe the nuclear fusion in the future is unstable. Maybe the company just doesn't care and is using some unstable technology. So I will give them a little bit of a window for that. But based on what we know about nuclear fusion, a runaway reaction like this because you've shut off the coolant is impossible. Now this becomes the primary driver of the plot in the second half of the movie. And this corresponds with James Cameron's kind of obsession with having nuclear re explosions in his movies but it is not accurate. I love this movie so much. <laughs> Nuclear explosions can burn out your retinas, but that's only if you're looking right at the explosion as it goes off. If you're seeing reflected light, it may uh, temporarily blind you or something like that, but it's not gonna burn out your retinas. I do love that little character moment though, where she covers Newt's eyes right before the explosion goes off. from her, you bitch. No scientific comment here. Just, I love that line. I love that character moment. These movies are regarded as sci-fi classics, and justifiably so. They are two fantastic movies, and what's wonderful is they are two very different movies. These movies were made by two great directors, and they couldn't be more different. Alien is, of course, a haunted house movie, a horror movie, where these almost defenseless people are trying their best to escape the monster that's lurking in the shadows. Aliens, on the other hand, is a rocking action movie that's almost like riding a roller coaster. I saw this in the theaters and I remember people screaming as the aliens would jump out of the shadows or pop up from behind floors and so forth. Like, But they both are just fantastic at what they do. Alien, of course, has this amazing cast with uh, uh, Tom Skerritt and Yafit Kodo and John Hurt. And this was really what made Sigourney Reaver a household name, her role in that. And it's it's just wonderfully directed and, and spooky and scary. And Aliens is just thrilling, but also scary and, and, th and seat of your pants. Uh, in that case, you have a cast that's more character actors, like uh, Al Matthews and Michael Bean and Lance Hendrickson. But they all just do this amazing job and they're well directed by Cameron. Just two absolutely fantastic movies. And of course, you have Ellen Ripley, one of the great characters in science fiction. Uh, the arc that she goes through 
from being someone who is terrified of the alien and trying her best to deal with the situation to this fierceness we see at the end where she's defending her surrogate daughter from the most powerful alien that exists, that we rarely see that kind of arc done so well in movies. There's a lot of talk these days about strong women characters in movies. And this, of course, Ellen Ripley is a, is a trendsetter in that. But what I love about this character is she's not only a strong woman, she's a strong woman. A lot of these strong women characters seem like they took a male character and changed the name and cast an actress instead and just left it as is. It's impossible to imagine Ellen Ripley being the same character if she were a man. It's impossible to imagine the character having the same resonance and making the same choices and having the same impact on our culture if she were played by anyone other than the amazing Sigourney Weaver in this career-defining role. The, these movies are very good, but Ripley is what connects them. Ripley is the through line. She is the anchor of both movies who ties them together and uh, establishes the emotional arcs and eventually brings it to its satisfying conclusion. And I'm just glad there wasn't a sequel to Aliens that uh, peed all over the uh, happy ending that we have here. Oh, right. As for the science, it's actually not that bad. I mean, you do have faster than light travel and stuff like that. The Xenomorph's physiology is not that outrageous. You do have realistic concepts like fusion reactors and being at Zeta Reticuli, which is a known system. Alien, when it was released, had kind of tepid reviews. And one of the criticisms, I think it was Gene Siskel who made this, was that it wasn't really a science fiction movie. It was more of a horror movie. I would actually push back against that. No one goes to an alien movie to get the science. You go there for the thrills and the and the terror and the and the kick acidness and all that stuff. But the science is part of the warp and weft of these films. It's kind of an ostinato that gives the films that extra punch, that extra bit of realism that makes you buy into the movie, that makes you go into these situations so that you understand what's happening, you care about what's happening, you understand the situations. And I think the homework that was done by the writers to at least tie it in to real scientific concepts, even if they took it in some fanciful directions, is one of the many, many things that makes these movies classic. So I'm delighted to be able to do to talk about these movies. Uh, it's been a great year for the channel, and that's thanks to all of you who've been subscribing. Please subscribe. And liking, please like. And recommending this to people. I, I can't begin to say how grateful I am for the attention and how much uh, uh, I enjoy seeing your comments and your likes and so forth. Uh, hopefully in 2023, we'll have some uh, amazing stuff. In the meantime, have a great holiday season. And uh, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.